interesting uh, presentation today. Thank you, KK. And uh, Paulina, is it? Uh, we have two of you together. Hello, um, Erica Everett, um, Community Development Officer. Um, with Hi, guys. Here. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm the Community Development Officer at City of Joondalup in Western Australia. And I do our access and inclusion portfolio. So that's disability, multicultural and reconciliation. And I'm Pauline Walk, also a community development officer at the city of Joondalup, um, Western Australia. And I focus on um, seniors, uh, volunteering, homelessness and capacity building. Lovely to be here and meet you all. Uh, and you too. Thank you very much both from uh, the Southern Hemisphere. So it's much later in the day for both of you. And uh, apologies, I, I didn't realise that was part of your surname as well as the Pauline bit. So uh, you're very welcome, Pauline. And then we have Minnie, New Zealand. If you can hear me, um, I'm not sure if Minnie is your first name. Um, but you're very welcome. And if you just want to put a little message in the chat, um, that would be wonderful as well. But we'll keep things moving along. Um, Debbie. Hello. Can you hear me? No? Okay. Well, same again. If you want to put a little message in the chat, that would be great. And we'll just keep moving along. Shirley, good afternoon. Oh, yes, good. <laughs> good afternoon. Oh, it's sorry. afternoon time in, uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, I'm Shirley. Uh, I'm teaching at the Hong Kong Baptist University. And I, um, and I just recently joined the IACB as, um, board of, as trustees, okay? <laughs> as trustees uh, of East Asia. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, Shirley. And uh, we're delighted to have you here and on the board. Um, and Nancy. Good morning. I think I can confidently say that it's still yes. morning in Rwanda. <laughs> yeah, good morning. I'm Nancy. Uh, lovely to meet you. I'm seeing some familiar names and just saying hello to my Umoja Nausawa team members who I can see here as well in the room. Uh, please let me know when I'm good to go. I can see we still have a few people that haven't introduced themselves. Yes. Uh, Anne? Yeah. Yeah, one or two left. So Anastasia, good morning. Early start for you too. Hi, Anna. I'm Anastasia Quickly. Um, I've been, I'm from Ireland, as you might guess from my accent, not to mention how I look and all the rest. A little bit, uh, uh, Trina Kayla at this hour of the morning. I've been involved with IACD for a number of years. I'm chair of the All-Ireland Endorsement Body for Community Work, Education and Training. And I, I won't bother saying anything else about myself. That's enough for now. Okay. As well as chair of Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre and previously head of the Department of Applied Social Studies in Benut, which is what brings together the um, presentation we'll be making this morning and the discussion we'll be having. That's great. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Uh, can I maybe ask you if you could angle your camera very slightly back a little bit so that we can, when you sit back, we can see your face, but when you're leaning forward, that's perfect. Um, that's great. Thank you. And uh, who do we have left then? Trish. Good morning. Good afternoon. OK, we'll move along again if you want to just introduce yourself in the chat and uh, Mandisa. Uh, greetings, greetings everyone. My name is Mandisa, Mandisa Kongo. I'm happy to be here um, from South Africa. I work for CBM. I'm the regional advisor for the community based interest development. Wonderful. Sorry for joining late. Thank Not you. Not at all. You're very welcome. And then I think that leaves now. I know this, I think this is a surname, not a first name. Nagis, can you help me out with 
a Yeldon Believa. I can't, I, I think we've met, but I can't remember the first name. This is name. my device, I'm sorry. Oh, my it's you. <laughs> or technical issues. Okay, that's fine. No problem at all. Well, we've, we've, we've had you introduce yourself twice then, and we've got a few more joining here. So very quickly, we'll take a couple more, and then we'll need to sort of move on. Uh, Roxanne, good morning, good afternoon. Okay, and... Uh, Boniface, is it? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Good afternoon. Good, morning. good evening. And where are you joining us from? From Kenya. From Kenya. Wonderful. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, and we'll just then take Liz and then we'll, we'll move on to the presentations. Okay, we'll leave it there then. Anybody who hasn't been able to introduce themselves um, verbally, if you'd like to pop a little hello into the chat, that would be great. And just let us know where you're from. Um, so welcome everyone to this first parallel session of the day. Um, this one is uh, bringing together three, three sets of speakers um, who are going to share with us some presentations broadly uh, exploring the themes of diversity, inclusion and intersectionality and some of the challenges for community development practice that that presents. And we have Nargis from Ureki who is with us to help with tech support. Um, each of our presentation uh, presenters groups has about 15 minutes. Um, for their presentation, and we uh, may have some slides as well. We will um, keep an eye on the time, and we'll work now on the running order that was in the program, as we have everybody here. Um, and then following the three sets of presentations, we'll open it up for um, a Q&A and discussion. Um, in the meantime, if you have any reflections or comments, please feel free to use the chat. Um, but we are a relatively small group, so hopefully we'll be able to get some um, discussion going following. Um, just noticed, uh, is there anything we need to do with this closed captioning? Who can see this transcript recording on Nargis, or is that okay? You don't need permissions for that, do you? Okay, I'll take that. That's, that's okay. That's grand. Okay, so our first speaker then um, is Nancy from Rwanda. And Nancy, I'm going to let you introduce yourself um, any um, additional way you wish. And over to you. And you have about 15 minutes. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for this discussion. Uh, uh, I'll be focusing on looking at the tensions in the inclusion space. Uh, I'll be sharing a few slides here, but I'm hoping we have an engaging session because at least our numbers allow for that. Feel free to type on the chat if you have any feedback to what uh, we are sharing currently, uh, or if you have some comments to make, right? Yeah, so uh, this is the topic that I had. Uh, and this, this is uh, a map of Africa, just to give a bit of context that I'm Kenyan. I've lived in Kenya most of my life, but currently I live in Rwanda. I've been here for one year. I work in the diversity and inclusion space for a university here known as Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, before joining this university, I used to work in a program and we would work in diversity and inclusion in different parts of Africa. This is West Africa, East Africa and Southern Africa, not so much in the North uh, Africa. So most of the experiences that I'll share here reflect what I've learned working in those parts of, of the continent. Uh, and I'm really excited that I'll get to hear your feedback as well from all these other parts of the world. Uh, this is a bit about my uh, working experience uh, in the diversity and inclusion from banking to working for the government of Kenya to a consultancy firm and a non-profit. Uh, and that just means that I've had, uh, I've been able to work in different uh, organizations, which gives maybe uh, a bit of context as well in what I'm sharing. Uh, and what I'll share is more looking into the insight of what people who are interested or championing inclusion face or people who work specifically in this space. And um, 
I thought it would be useful to share a bit of context. Uh, and this is from the Edelman Trust Barometer 2022. Edelman Trust Barometer tries to look at the status of trust and trust levels uh, in different countries of the world. Uh, it's one of the few uh, studies that usually looks at uh, all continents. And it just emphasizes the big role that inclusion has to play because one of the top five issues or concerns that people have is experiencing prejudice or racism. Uh, that tells you how big this is. And this is a global survey yeah, that was done here. And another perspective that I thought would be interesting is that uh, business and NGOs are being seen as the most trust, trusted organizations in most parts of the world, while government and media are seen as building division, tension uh, in most parts of the world. That just gives a bit of scope in terms of where we work and how we can contribute to building this trust and inclusion in the different parts of the world we are in. Uh, these are just still the top issues that we are dealing with, climate change, job loss, income inequality and discrimination, just emphasizing on the inequality and discrimination because this is the space we are talking about here and how critical it is that we have such spaces like what we have in this conference to share and learn from each other, right? But also reflect on our practice, yeah? Uh, this is a bit of summarizing of the issue that I see here, that uh, injustice and inequality remains huge issues globally. Uh, very, We have many uh, types of trainings on diversity and inclusion, community development, but most of them don't look at the, in the internal perspective in terms of the dilemmas or the tensions that practitioners face. It's focused mostly on the models that we should be using. Right, And so you find that most of the practitioners are facing frustration, there's need for clarity, need for support structures, which is, like I said, something useful that the conferences like this provide for us, right, a space to share our, our, our experience. Yeah, and here when I'm talking about uh, tension, I'm looking at it from a point of relationship between ideas or qualities that have conflicting demands or implications. So none of the sides have a bad or good, but they just have conflicting uh, positions, right? Uh, and here we are talking more of a spectrum perspective rather than good and bad uh, or black and white. We are talking about the grays. Uh, and this is a state of being stretched tight, which is something I feel we experience in some of these spaces sometimes, right? And please feel free to, <laughs> to also contribute in terms of the ch chat function. And these are some of the tensions that I'll summarize on, uh, although I think there are more than this. And one of the top one is power and power differences. We work in organizations where what matters and what is a priority uh, is sometimes decided by headquarters. And these headquarters you'll find are usually in the global South countries. So sometimes you find that the power to decide what issues are a priority in terms of the inclusion space don't really come from the communities or the spaces we work in. And so that brings in attention in the space of people in this space, because you want to say, this is a priority issue here, but the funding that you've been given, the role you've been given, requires you to focus, for example, on gender equality only, on disability inclusion, for example. Not that it's bad to focus on those areas, but sometimes from the point of the person working in that space and living in that space, you can see that there are other priorities that should also be factored in or focused on, uh, but you have no power sometimes to change what has been decided as the key issue that this organization will deal with. So I feel that this is one of the uh, tensions that people can face in this space. Uh, sometimes even deciding uh, this issue is important, this issue gets funding and this issue gets attention. Uh, it's not, sometimes it's not something that practitioners can determine, although they can influence in some ways. Uh, another perspective here in power and power differences is hierarchy as well, where you have, uh, uh, you're working with the leadership or with the teams, and sometimes one of the team does not really believe in, in this so much. And I remember in a session we had where one of the practitioners was telling us, sometimes I discuss this with the leadership, but when I go to their team members, they haven't shared to the team members why uh, we are doing this, why inclusion matters, why inclusion is part of the priorities in the organization. So uh, people in this field are always pushed between 
uh, these these perspectives. And I know you have other examples that you can raise uh, in terms of this. Uh, just because of time, maybe I'll move ahead. Uh, the second one I see here is the context, and this is related to the first, where most of the data we have that we are using to identify issues that require attention have not been done. The researches have not been done in our context. Most of the surveys and studies are based in the global south. <clears throat> so by the time we are identifying issues, we are not the ones who set the agenda, right? And the agenda has been set by studies not that have not been done here. That doesn't mean the issues are not an issue in our context here, but that we should really look at how we can invest more in data so that we find out the pertinent issues that we need to focus on and prioritize on in our specific context. So this is one of those uh, related issues to the first one where this is the focus in the organization, but this is what you feel is the root cause or the root issues that is affecting that community. And sometimes there's that tension in practitioners in terms of not having the data or using the data that is actually applicable to their context. The third one is uh, there's a lot of emphasis on system, systemic uh, issues and focusing on systemic uh, uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. But again, it's hard as a practitioner to not focus on the operational or the transactional, right? Because we know it's the individuals who make up the systemic. So uh, there is always that push and pull between, yes, systems matter, policies matter and all that, but also people matter and we must work to change their attitudes and perspectives and mindsets in terms of issues to do with inclusion. So sometimes there's a push and pull between uh, focusing on one rather than the other. Uh, and uh, I'll share my, my reflections on how I deal with this. But for this, I always say we can work on both. We don't have to pick one side, right? Despite the, 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 the what is being said and pushed as more important than the other. Uh, fourthly is the assumption of homogeneity or representation, which I, which I think is a very dangerous thing that we see here where because I'm black, you assume I'm representing all the black people, all the black Kenyans. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's very it it sort of puts people into some circles, and and it doesn't really aga well personally. I feel for inclusion, because as much as I'm a, um, I'm black, and this is how you see me, I have some perspectives that may be different from other black people, and that should also be it should be something we are cognizant of even as we set these programs that women are not the same. People with disability are not the same, right? Yeah, so the support that they need will be different sometimes. And this is, it complicates the work. It's easier to say, oh, let's work with women, let's work with uh, people with disability. But going to the level of looking at intersectionality, it complicates things, but it also allows us to look at how complex uh, the world is and to appreciate it for what it is, that you can't use me as the poster child for all black women, for example. And you can design a program with me in mind that will meet the needs of all the black women in the world, right? So just showing that it's a role, it's a, like community development, you really have to keep on engaging and re-engaging with the people and keep on learning what matters and what are the root issues that we want to deal with, not assuming that uh, one person represents everyone or that we are homogeneous. And lastly, is this pressure for immediate change in the field of community development and diversity and inclusion when we know sometimes change takes time. And sometimes practitioners will always have, be in this tension of trying to show the immediate goals and looking for the low lying fruit. Uh, whereas sometimes we also need to engage our communities and to share, share with them that change takes time. It will not be achieved in two months. We are reiterating and changing how we work so that it meets the needs of the communities we work with. And that is not a one minute uh, issue. We won't just solve the issues today, which creates a problem because when we look at power, we mentioned that sometimes even the funding we get, it's just one year. When you know one year, you'll just it's just the tip of the iceberg. You will not really be able to touch anything in that one year, even if it's training. So, um, maybe not only educating our communities, but, but even our donors in terms of what is relevant in terms of these changes that we are hoping to see in the world, right? Uh, and how uh, long-term investment will mean a lot uh, uh, rather than just coming and popping in with a small grant and you move out before the messages, 
that you are trying to pass on really resonate with the communities we are working with. Yeah, please, uh, these are the few that I could mention in the time we have available, but I'm really keen to hear what dilemmas you faced in the different spaces you are in, because I'm sure these are not really limited to my continent here. Please feel free to type on the chat room uh, and we will be looking at these comments. Uh, does it, do, do any of this resonate? Is this something that you've experienced? Have you had any tension or dilemma in terms of your family, workplace or community? And what were your reflections on that? We will really be keen to, to hear that. Please feel free to, to share with us. So in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the to how I've managed to deal with these gray areas in terms of my working field. But even as you share your uh, dilemmas or tensions, please also share with me how you've resolved or made, uh, created some balance uh, as a person in this space. Uh, so in terms of my learning, in terms of how I've De dealt with the dilemmas or tensions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one thing that I found so important for me is grounding uh, inclusion um, in strategic or organizational values in terms of whichever organization I've been part in. And that just makes uh, you make greater strides than when you package inclusion as important just by itself. I feel like when it's linked to the organizational values and when you're careful in unpacking the organization values you have, even if it's um, respect. Uh, uh, you can just unpack it and link it to inclusion. If inclusion is not really in the organizational values, you can sort of pick one of the values, ethics, integrity, link it to inclusion and use that when you're motivating in the organization why some things are very important to work with. I found that that has made uh, me move faster and have those, um, quick wins as we call them, even as we wait for the big systemic changes that will come in time. Because at the end of the day, the people we are working with, they need to know that what we are doing is also bearing some fruit. You, you know, it takes time to, to change some things, but we need to also show that the things we are working on are bearing some fruit along the way. And I feel like this is one of the ways that helps uh, us win quickly. Number two, just factor in nuance and context at all times. It's never just black and white. Sometimes we work with context and dualities, yeah? And when you are working with context, I think we will be able to really uh, be able to implement more meaningful change than having black and white. This is right, this is wrong. You need to know D&I and just being very offended when people don't know or don't understand what you are trying to work at. Yeah, uh, we have to really work with the context and also that change can take time. Yeah, we are not at the same space. And the third one um, is uh, mindset and behavior change. I think this is a big one in this space uh, and it's linked to what I said, the perspective that sometimes change takes time, behavior change takes time. And what I've found to be useful for the communities that I work in is just agreeing that uh, maybe you will not see eye to eye on me in terms of the importance of gender equality or how I, 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 or inclusion. But in this space where we work in this organization, this is the behavior expected of us that demonstrate that we see the value of inclusion, whether it's gender equality, disability inclusion, whichever change or inclusion you are looking at. Your personal views matter, but at this point, we will have to work on that to change that, yeah? We don't expect you to lie or, or to say you really are a believer now, if you're not. Uh, even as we work to change these ideas that we've grown up with and so been socialized with, it's good to have some set charter rules in terms of how we interpret inclusion in the spaces we are in. Then that means whether your mindset has been changed and you appreciate this inclusion or not, this is how you will be behave in this space, in this community that we own together. Personal values, uh, I think this is also has been really important to me in the spaces that I've been in that at the end of the day, we are all pursuing humanity and dignity, right? And it's linked to the mindset change. Whether the senior manager or the team member does not understand what we are trying to achieve in terms of inclusion, uh, they would understand the importance of humanity and dignity for all uh, human beings. And I think that's a really powerful place I've found uh, to start with when working in inclusion, even beyond what people call the business case, yeah? As, as very one important. minute left, Nancy. 
Okay. And uh, looking at relationships as well, um, that's a very important thing, relationship building in this kind of uh, field. Uh, a learning mindset and attitude, uh, uh, and also just strategy. Pick your battle, decide which issues you want to achieve, then move to the other one. You can't deal with everything and be able to handle it as one person or two people sometimes. So these are just some reflections that have helped me work through the uh, tensions that I spoke about. Uh, I think that's it from me. Happy to hear your feedback. Thank you so much for giving us this time. And uh, these are our contacts, yeah. Uh, our organization is known as Umoja Naustawa, and this is how you can reach us should you have any questions. We also have this blog known as Embrace Everyone uh, that you can reach out to for resources related to what we've discussed here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you very much for a, a very interesting and insightful presentation. And there was quite a lot in terms of what you were saying that was resonating with me. Um, particularly in terms of the um, the ideas around power and power differences and the systemic versus the operational it reminded me of a conversation I've had just this week <laughs> around some of those themes. I think they come up regularly again and again um, and present um, ongoing challenges for us in our community development practice. Um, as well as on a broader basis. I'm sure there are plenty of questions and comments, but we'll move on and hear from our next set of speakers and um, and then we can bring that, that discussion together. Uh, I can see we've been joined by quite a few more people as well. So you're all very welcome this morning or this afternoon. And um, uh, John has been sharing some of your, uh, your links that you referred to in the chat as well. So that's great. And now then, our second set of speakers are Anastasia Crickley, Kira Bradley and Lindsay Kavanagh from Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to hand directly over to you and let you introduce yourselves any further and move into your presentation. And again, you have 15 minutes and I'll give you a little reminder as we get towards the last minute or two. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, and thank you everybody for joining us so early in the morning. Uh, I'm going to just introduce this uh, short presentation and then Kira and Lindsay will follow through. Uh, the, what we sent you uh, in, to put into words that maybe are more suitable for this morning is an, an outline. And if you move to the first slide there, here, whoever is doing the slides, I don't know, you, you will see yeah. a very nice explanation of what we're going to do. But if I was to try to link that uh, to uh, diversity, inclusion and intersectionality, I'm thinking also about what Nancy has been saying. I mean, our, our real purpose in examining our approach to research this morning mm -hmm. has go beyond research to the relevance of research, uh, to the rights of the researched. Uh, and, and also to how research agendas are shaped, uh, to thinking a little bit perhaps about the role also of research and writing in community development and in community work. And in Ireland, we use those terms interchangeably. So our presentation this morning is firmly grounded in thinking about community work and community development and thinking also <coughs> about how research needs to be shaped in order to inform that. And what's really important here also is the starting points we come from. And I speak as someone who's been actively involved over an extended period of time in both Pabby Point and the Department of Applied Social Studies at Minute University, which was, I was also involved in setting up. So uh, Kira and Lindsay will talk about the missions, but the missions of both uh, Pabby Point and uh, the Department of Applied Social Studies are very clear and speak to collective change rather than individual advancement, which provides both with a very clear starting point in terms of our understandings of research. And also both have taken very, very much over the years, a long view. Uh, if you look, for example, at the campaign in Ireland for uh, travellers and Roma achieving minority ethnic group status and are having their ethnicity acknowledged rather than recognized because travelers in Roma were already minority ethnic groups in Ireland. We started campaigning on that in Pabby Point when the organization began in 1985 and eventually 
that was achieved in, on the 1st of March 2017. Uh, in, in Manut, we moved very rapidly in the mid 1980s from being uh, just a postgraduate professional diploma in community development to being uh, to having also a non-undergraduate program that was deliberately targeted and set up inclusive uh, pre-entry practices to <clears> ensure <throat> that people from the communities that get inflicted with community workers and researchers and all of the rest of us to ensure that people from those communities whether they were travelers and roma people of african descent from marginalized communities that they had a, a chance to actually actively participate and throughout and throughout this presentation as well i think it's useful to say that we have we've always in both organizations had a big consciousness of differentials and diversities within differentials and diversities within the community of community workers and differentials and diversities within the communities of travelers and roma mm. and we have very actively sought to articulate to deal with these and to articulate them, to acknowledge, for example, that even if uh, travellers and Roma who would have traditional views about some things may not have supported repealing the Eighth Amendment, which is about the women's right to access to abortion services in Ireland, or the right of sex mm. workers to organise themselves, that we, one doesn't have to agree with that, but that as an organisation we support the rights of others to actually be in those spaces. And as far as uh, the Department of Applied Social Studies in Maynooth University was concerned, that while we have actually supported the sort of equality, diversity and inclusion space in the university, we have tended to name things in very direct terms and talk very directly about racism. So that's just by way of introduction and, and to give you some context. Now I'm going to hand over to Lindsay and Kira to take you through our, um, our presentation. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anastasia. Um, and just for a bit of background um, for, for everyone, we're, we're talking today about um, an approach to research in community development. Um, and we're talking about a partnership and going to give you some background um, on how that partnership has evolved between the Department of Applied Social Studies in Maynooth, which has a central concern with educating community workers um, uh, dating back 40 years. And we're celebrating our 40 year anniversary um, in a couple of weeks time um, and as Stacia um, mentioned already she was one of the founders of, of this uh, department and this uh, program back at that time and our mission um, is very clear it's, it's to promote human rights social justice and equality nationally and internationally through excellence and in innovation in education research and public engagement um, with that really clear focus on on human rights um, and we're very concerned with power with collective analysis collective action and um, for collective change and that's central to our programs in terms of, of education and um, for our community workers um, and you know that this isn't just about the micro level and relational level um, but that we take that um, kind of structural analysis um, it, through the task and process of, of community work um, and I'm going to hand over now to Lindsay who will tell you a bit about the background of, of Pavi Point um, and the mission there and you'll see the intersections between, between the two and the work that we do which we'll explain in, in a moment. Thanks Karen. I suppose in terms by way of, of Pavi Point, it's a national traveller and Roma organisation based in Ireland. And I suppose our mission in terms of our work really aligns with the mission and the vision of, of the Department of Applied Social Studies. And really, I suppose over the past 30 years, Pavi Point has established a very strong track record in terms of innovation and groundbreaking work using a community development approach, really mm -hmm. focusing on addressing traveller and Roma issues and promoting traveller and Roma rights. Um, and in terms of our vision, I put up our mission, but really in terms of our vision, it's really looking, I suppose, forward in terms of travellers in Rome are fully recognised and respected as minority ethnic groups who are proud and confident in their cultural identity and exercising their human rights. And again, Pavi Point would always take the collective, as uh, Kira and, and Anastasia have said, collective um, approach. And I suppose really looking at those structural issues in terms of addressing and um, addressing them. So next slide, Kira, I think it's back to you. Uh, yeah, so today we're here to talk about um, research, research as practice in community work and research as practice for community work um, outcomes. And I suppose we might start by saying, well, why is research important for community workers? 
And that there are the, the basic things that, you know, we trot out in any kind of professional practice, that research informed practice is important, that research can capture community development practice and help us to develop an understanding of that practice. But we've also found um, in working on the ground that uh, as organisations are constantly responding to requests for research and that the research agenda is being set up often outside um, community work organisations and um, is being led often by funders or by um, other interested parties, you know, interested in social policy, uh, interested in documenting. But um, we found a challenge uh, in our, our work with this and that um, there's a hijacking of the space of, of what's happening, you know, on the ground in communities and often uh, the community work kind of vision and mission is not being responded to through um, external research. Uh, so while organisations, community workers might be involved in leading, commissioning or managing research um, through our work, uh, I suppose we're trying to, to, to challenge that um, and, and develop an approach to research that um, takes that action. So um, <clears throat> takes a transformative kind of philosophy towards research and sees research as part of the action towards social change, um, as a tool for action for social change. Um, and so today we're going to ask and pose some questions about how this um, might, you know, how this can be done uh, through our work. Sorry, let's change the slide. So, in line with um, community development practice um, and, and, a, and being a value-based practice with collective um, analysis, collective action, you know, for collective uh, social change, we can think about um, the relation, you know, the approach to research as solidarity and, and as community development practice at a number of different levels from the micro relational level that, you know, has been spoke about somewhat this morning, um, but also at a structure and um, at a structural level uh, and think about some of the core community development principles within that participation, empowerment, um, structure analysis uh, of inequality at every stage of the, of the process and ultimately with a quick commitment for social change um, and for um, ontology if we or for equality rather. If we think about our ontology, our theory of being, how do we exist in the world, this structural analysis is really important. Um, and our epistemology of research practice, our theory of knowledge, how we can know what we can know, then it ultimately it has to start with a collaborative practice from the very outset, that the agenda can't be set um, outside of community development practice, out of, outside of communities where the issues are being felt and experienced. Um, and that as community workers, we have, uh, you know, a responsibility of engaging in research practice um, to set the set the agenda um, and move beyond, I suppose, um, the approaches that have been taken so far in terms of, of research practice around peer research, but rather that uh, community workers and communities on the ground would be involved in research at every stage of the process from the beginning right through to the to the out, um, outcomes of research and action for change. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Lindsay now, who's going to talk a little bit about how we've tried to approach that um, in the partnership between um, the Department of Applied Social Studies in the university space and um, Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre um, on the ground and give you some insight into some of the, the issues, I suppose, that have stimulated our uh, work in this area. Yeah, I suppose just to say in terms of Pavi Point, we have over 30 years of experience in terms of research. Um, and I suppose we're recognized both nationally and internationally for our contributions in terms of not only setting the agenda, as Kira had said, but also in terms of shaping uh, the research right through from, you know, setting the, the research questions right through the dissemination. Um, and I suppose just some of the examples um, would be the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study, which was the first peer-led um, you know, national piece of research which involved actively involved travellers um, in terms of the research. So it was peer led, um, it was traveller women, uh, over 300 nationally going out and undertaking research on behalf of the community. Um, and I suppose from that research is what you have a strong evidence base for our work and for other travel organizations to lobby for that, as, as Kira had said, that structural change, that policy change to, I suppose, improve um, conditions and improve the lives of, of travelers on the ground. And out of that research, there was an 80% 80, 80 participation rate, which is unprecedented, you know, in any in any research uh, for a so-called hard to reach group. So I suppose we would be very conscious and that all of the research in which we engage in, and we've engaged in a number of research projects over the past 30 years, is that, you know, that, that, that approach that using that community development approach to inform the research process is imperative, it's vital. 
Um, and then we see other pieces of research in which we've either directly commissioned or overseen over the, the past number of years, including the first national Roman needs assessment in Ireland, again, using a peer led uh, methodology. And then most recently, we would have worked with the Fundamental Rights Agency uh, to undertake, again, another piece of uh, research, peer led research. Um, and we were the only country that undertook a peer led approach, whereas in some of the other member states, that wasn't the case. So, again, we have, you know, a very strong, I suppose, um, research presence both in Ireland and abroad and we're recognised for expertise um, and I suppose what we would see as I said using that community work or community development approach to inform every stage of that process um, I suppose we were quite concerned in Pavi Point as were colleagues in terms of Manus that we would have worked with a long-standing relationship with colleagues in Manus about the increasing I suppose uh, requests um, for engagement of, of research particularly I would say, you know, particularly during the COVID period. Um, and we were quite conscious prior to COVID that this was this was also the case. Um, and I think historically, um, you know, travelers in Ireland have often been overused, oversampled for uh, for the purpose of research. Um, and it's often, I suppose we would say very problematic research because that research is used in policy and other spaces to reinforce at racism, discrimination, and so forth. So we were we were quite concerned in Pavi Point, um, and really what we were looking at is to set up um, a formal mechanism. We always had informal mechanisms, I suppose, over over the number of years as community workers ourselves. We were always busy doing a number of other things, but we were really concerned, I suppose, um, around setting up a formal mechanism to really, I suppose, put on the agenda what we mean by partnership research and what we mean by human rights based approaches to research. So in 2021, uh, we established uh, the Pavi Point Research Advisory Group. Um, and that's not to say we didn't have, I suppose, informal mechanisms before, but I suppose in 2021, we really, I suppose, um, prioritised that as, as a core piece of our work. Um, and really what we wanted to set out to do was consolidate the learning over the past 30 years with colleagues from Maynooth, but also colleagues from other universities that we would have worked with over a number of years consolidate what we learned and I suppose really share um, and set I suppose a framework together in terms of what does you know a human rights based approach to research look like what does partnership look like um, and when we talk about partnership it can mean different things in different spaces so in terms of I suppose you know Nancy's presentation you talk about setting the agenda and I suppose using that data we were also concerned with that because as Kier had said the agenda had often been set prior to engaging with research so we set out um, to establish a, a working group and I really I suppose at the at the crux of it, it was really to look at what does a practice informed research look like and then how does research informed like practice look like and um, and really what we had we've set out um, a framework and really what you know we would be conscious that research isn't just I suppose collaborative engagement but we have staff on external research advisory committees were asked to disseminate research. So what we have is a framework that really sets out um, our key approach uh, to, to, to the research um, you know, the research process. Um, and I suppose what we would be saying is that it's not just around, you know, around that partnership approach, but it's also looking at what does an ethical research, research practice look like? Uh, we were also concerned, I suppose, that the external, and um, particularly in terms of higher education, external ethical um, committees and um, approving pieces of research uh, without engaging with the communities prior to that. So really, we looked at how do you ensure a, a, an ethical research practice? Um, and then I suppose what we were looking at is that, you know, um, to share our experience and to share our learning, learning with other partners and with other um, key stakeholders. And um, so, you know, as, as a committee, we meet four times a year, we consider all of the research requests that have come into Pavi Point, um, and then we decide based on a set of criteria, and we can share it uh, with you after the, the presentation, but set on, 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 a, on a, you know, clear criteria around who, set, who has set the research agenda, what is your understanding of the key issues, so really, I suppose, interrogating, as Kira was saying, the researchers, and really, I suppose, spinning that power dynamic on its head um, in terms of, you know, that there is a need to look at that and saying, you know, that there's a need to challenge researchers um, and not, I suppose, um, in a bad way, but it's also good research practice to be interrogated yourself. So so I suppose that's kind of where we um, we would see ourselves in terms of looking at setting the research agenda, looking at a human rights a human rights based approach and I suppose seeing partnership not as just you know um, 
engaging in terms of uh, a very on a very preliminary way, but really seeing that research, you know, right through the to the end in terms of dissemination, in terms of looking at, you know, what are the implications for mm -hmm. our work as communities and also for the communities in which we work in partnership with. I think we're going to have to um, call this uh, session presentation to an end. If you've got one minute that you want to just sort of sum up anything, um, please do, but then we'll need to move on to the other um, speakers and then we can come back for the discussion. Thanks, Anna. Stacia, would you like to say the final words? Um, no, I think I think we've covered everything. Perhaps just since people may not be aware, uh, the fundamental rights agency that Lindsay mentioned is the European Union fundamental rights agency. And maybe also to acknowledge that sometimes, including with the EU fundamental rights agency, which I'm involvement with, you don't automatically get what you want. I mean, some of these spaces that Lindsay is talking about were new, was a new, were, were new in terms of uh, the, the researchers and the research agencies. But uh, I, I'd have to say that uh, with a bit of determination, um, it has been possible to negotiate those spaces. So uh, what we wanted to tell you really was just a little bit about our approach and we welcome questions and we're very, we're, we'd be glad to share any documents we have with you afterwards. And, and just to emphasize, I suppose that, you know, research is important for community work and for the communities that we work with and that as community workers, we shouldn't shy away from that and rather get, you know, stuck into the discussions and and take up our own power for the agenda that, that we are trying to um, address, you know, for human rights and for equality. Thank you. OK, thank you, um, Anastasia, Kira, and uh, Lindsay for that presentation. And again, some very pertinent um, themes that are connecting um, not only with uh, what Nancy was saying, but I resonate with me very much as well about in whose interests a lot of evaluation, particularly in terms of a research um, piece takes place. Uh, we'll move on then to our final set of presentations and um, hopefully come back with time for some good good discussion because I think this one could, la could last a lot longer than an hour and a half if we had the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Shirley and Kyle uh, from Hong Kong and um, over to you and I shall let you take it from here. Uh, and again, you have about 15 minutes and I'll give you the word when we get to that point. Okay, um, thank you very much. So the, um, um, uh, the presentation will be done by me and Kyle and also KK, but KK will be take charge of will be taking charge of the um, uh, questions and 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 discussion. Um, so the topic that we're going to share with you is developing social capital strategies to address intersectionality. I think saying to the um, to Anastasia's team, I think we 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 treasure very much how research um, findings can inform the practice. So um, actually, what KK and I have been doing in the past 10 years on the topic of social capital is to find out how community development strategies can develop different kinds of um, social capital for the benefits of the um, disadvantaged communities. Um, but our uh, this, this project started actually two years ago during the COVID-19 and we have encountered tremendous difficulties in data collection uh, because we, 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 we cannot go into the community to do um, um, interviews and, and, and so on. Uh, so um, today what we're going to share with you is some preliminary um, research findings that we think um, um, are relevant to uh, community development um, strategies. So um, you can see that actually uh, from the title um, uh, actually, um, let me show you. Um, the topic of the research actually is related to gender and intersectionality. Um, so in the very beginning, I would like to share a little bit uh, about the concept of um, intersectionality. So it's a concept uh, emerged when Black feminists challenged previous feminist perspectives for separating race, class, and gender as determinants of inequalities. Um, and argued for examining the interlocking patterns instead of a single factor in assessing uh, to power and privileges. So in emphasize on how the combinations um, generate specific complexities. So intersectionality theory calls for examinations of the interactions among the relations of oppression and privilege, such as race, class, age, sexuality, and gender, uh, with the aim of fostering um, greater social justice. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to skip some of the, <laughs> the slides uh, in the interest of time. Um, intersectionality and social capital, I think they're closely related. So um, we, we can identify um, research studies in the West on social capital in the past decades uh, that look into the relationship between gender and ethnicity, for example, uh, particularly to understand the economic situations and dynamics of immigrants and refugees. Uh, and in recent years, um, there are studies on intersectional social capital and gender and race in the Asian context. So here are some of the um, previous studies on intersectionality and social capital uh, in, the, in, the, in the Asian context. So um, this study titled Gendering and Intersectionality of Social Capital, Community Development in Beijing and Hong Kong. Um, gender is uh, one of the focuses. And we um, in, uh, actually, we, we were examining um, the relationship between gender and other social factors uh, in intersection and the relationship with social capital uh, in the community. So gender intersectionality, Intersection with um, the intersection with social capital and community development constitute a conceptual framework uh, of the study. Um, we we target low income female migrants in the community as um, as the focus, and their experiences are best exemplary of the impacts of the intersection of social statuses, gender, age, migration status, and class in real life. So we target at measuring intersectional social capital in Beijing and Hong Kong, uh, comparing intersectional workings of gender, age, migration status, and class in understanding social capital of deprived communities, to uh, identify outcomes for low-income migrant women in the two cities uh, of the intersectional workings of these factors, and to engender sensitize in this improving the measurement of social capital. Uh, uh, Kiki and I actually have um, 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 developed a social capital questionnaire in Chinese, uh, and we do want to make it um, uh, to engender the scale to sensitize it to the measurement of social capital um, in related to gender. And we would like to propose local and intersectional community development strategies to develop social capital for low income women migrants. So what we have to do is to conduct two community surveys in Hong Kong and Beijing. But unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 and political reasons, um, the survey in Beijing was not yet done, um, but we have managed more or less to finish um, the, um, com uh, to complete the community survey in Hong Kong. Uh, in addition to a community survey, we also conduct um, qualitative interviews um, for, uh, uh, with um, migrants so this presentation is the preliminary results uh, of, a, um, of the community study of the Fortune District, uh, a sub-district of, um, um, of Sam Shui Bo, um, the selected community uh, to study, uh, to be studied in Hong Kong. So we will draw implications on community development strategies to address intersectionality. So research methodology, representative sampling of 3% of the total households, um, measurements, um, we, we, we um, identify the um, uh, demographic variables and we use the social capital questionnaire scale uh, to measure um, social capital. So um, this is, um, um, I, I think it's, um, uh, it's useful to, to introduce the eight dimensions of um, general social capital that we, we, we have adopted. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, read them in detail, explain them in detail, but we'll talk a little bit more about it, about them um, uh, in the analysis. Um, so um, um, may I pass the time to Kyle to share with you uh, some of the major uh, preliminary findings? Yes, yeah. uh, thank yes. you, Shani. And I'm going to present the qualitative data to you. Uh, for the gender, there was the uh, income differences is significant between the female and male, and a warm and more women reported engaging as a precarious labor, such as the short-term contract and a part-time job, and a family caregivers. And next page. Okay, let's just have a quick look of the profile of the of, of the fortune community. Okay, next page. And, and then I will introduce the demographic variables and the social capital. And except for the gender and the other three variables, like the education, income, occupational status, are statistically different with the 
either general social capital and then some factors of the social capital scale. And uh, there were gender differences in social capital uh, was revealed by intersecting it with the other demographic variable. Okay, next page. Okay, next, just take a quick note of the association of the demographic variables and the social capital. But importantly, when we mix the gender and other social factors as a fixed factor, and there were some significant uh, statistical differences. Next page. Okay, next, firstly, it is the in intersection of gender and age. And gender and age jointly correlate the tolerance of a diversity and the value of life. The highest tolerance of diversity was falling into the female age, 18 to 29, and the male age, 40 to, 40 to 49. And the lowest tolerance of diversity was falling into the females, age 40 to 49. Nine and male aged in 18 to 29. And uh, for the older adult, they reported the most positive value of nine. Let us make a short summary. Uh, the young females and middle aged males reported higher tolerance of diversity in the community, while the middle aged females and the young males have the lower level of tolerance of diversity in the community. The older adults indicate a positive meaning of life in this study. Uh, the possible explanation may be that the factors of the tolerance of diversity in the living community and the value of life are related to the people's value orientation. It, re it reveals the attitude toward their relationship with others and their capacity for connectivity in the daily life. And in terms of the tolerance of diversity, the young female and middle-aged male ranked highest among the respondents, the majority of them are well educated, are well educated. Uh, high, the, uh, research indicated that the higher education level imply a more positive attitude toward the immigration and ethnic di diversity. The income group may also be an explanation for positive attitude toward the diverse population. Among the middle aged male, all of them are middle income group and high income group. And the value of life refers to their perception of whole life and their perceived connectivity to the society. More than half the older adults in this study rated satisfactory with their financial condition. And a study of Stephen in 2015 uh, suggests that self-perceived financial security appears to be important to improve the well-being of the older adults. And then let's move to the intersection of the gender and educational attainment. The gender and educational attainment generally affect the general social capital and its factors of participation in local community and a feeling of trust. The highest general social capital was falling into the female who are a sole degree and a male who are master degree. For the lowest general social capital are falling into the females who are low educated and male who are middle educated. For female, the well educated group has the general social capital significantly lower than the middle age group. But for the, but for the male, the well-educated group has significantly higher general social capital than those who are middle educated and low educated. Okay, next page. And for men, uh, we can conclude that the higher the educational attainment, the higher general social capital they receive. And it is similar to the research funding in Western context. But for the female, the female has not benefit from the higher educational attainment in general social capital. Next. And um, community participation and feeling of trust could explain this situation. And in terms of the participation in local community, uh, the well-educated female reported less community participation than the middle-educated group. And in terms of the feelings of trust and safety, the well-educated female reported lowest score. The well-educated female group reported their lower community participation and the feelings of trust and safety in the community. So these findings echoed with uh, a local study in Tin Shui Wai, Hong Kong, which has indicated that high educational level is correlated with lower level of trust to the community. 
Okay, let's move to the intersection of gender and income. And in our study, the high income group respondent reported greater feeling of trust and safety without the effect of gender. So uh, the male high income group reported greater feeling of trust and safety than the low and middle income group. And but the result for women is very different. The female high income group has no first feeling of trust and safety than the middle and low income group. The feeling of trust was also negatively associated with the income for female respondent. Um, okay, so let me continue with um, some discussions. Um, so the findings reveal that women of higher income and educational background have lower feelings of trust and safety. Uh, so there are gender differences uh, in factors of participation in local community, tolerance of diversity, value of life, the three components uh, of the general social capital. Um, and we can see how gender intersected with um, other social factors such as educational attainment, such as um, income, such as age. Um, so gender differences in social capital are reviewed when the lens of intersectionality are adopted. So we would like to draw um, implications of the research findings on commodity development. Um, in the con Hong Kong context, in some of the places in Asia, actually, social capital has been adopted as a major focus uh, of community development uh, services, uh, particularly those funded by the government. Um, so um, if we if we if we like to um, uh, examine um, how the research findings, the third preliminary findings, uh, have informed us about the um, community development strategies, uh, we will say that uh, community development should target at, for example, promoting the tolerance of diversity among young men and middle-aged women in the community, promoting local community participation of high educated women in the community and promoting feelings of trust and safety in the community among women of high income and high education. So these components of social capital are about community values, participation for empowerment, and civic education, uh, civic orientation. But um, um, same as the findings of a, um, another study conducted by KK and I um, back, to, back in uh, 2013 uh, about the strategies adopted by community workers in Hong Kong to develop social capital. Um, at that time, it was found that trust and solidarity or social cohesiveness was seldom addressed by community workers in Hong Kong. So according to the research findings of this study, we can see that the feelings of trust and safety is very um, uh, very different among different um, uh, groups. Um, um, so so uh, I we, we would like to say that um, social workers or community workers uh, have to address um, these dimensions, uh, including trust, including feelings of safety, uh, in, and also including um, the different types of community participation. And that study um, in 2013 actually also revealed that community workers are not, uh, were not very sensitive to um, the different types of um, social capital. We haven't talked very much about um, the types of social capital in this presentation, but um, uh, we, we, we do have covered this, this area in, uh, in our study. So um, given more time, we'll, we would like to explain a little bit more about um, the differences among the types and the purposes they serve and how different strategies can develop different types of um, social capital. So um, just a minute, Shirley. Yes. Left. Yes. Okay. Does Last two. There, there are implications on future research, so we'll skip it. <laughs> so um, our context. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Shirley. I didn't mean to sort of jump in. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all right. We were so it sounded like I was interrupting you rather than saying you have a minute left. Um, ah. But thank, thank you. Um, uh, Kyle, KK and Shirley for your um, uh, presentation as well, very detailed um, piece of research there and I was struck by, again by the connections um, of which you started off with talking about and came back to at the end as well in relation to um, the importance of trust which connected very clearly with what Nancy had been talking about right at the start. Um, but also the complexities around um, the impacts of intersectionality and what that means um, for people's lives and 
the lives of specific communities um, and the, the dangers or the challenges that we need to be aware of and cognizant of uh, in terms of making assumptions and making generalizations um, about people and, and groups of people and describing um, those generalizations across um, across large sections of society. So um, some very strong connecting themes I felt between all three of the presentations um, and each one of them extremely interesting. We have about 20 minutes left, uh, I'm pleased to say. Um, so um, uh, plenty of time for some good discussion. And uh, I'd like to open it up to the floor, really, um, if we have any questions from any of our participants. If you can uh, use the hand um, uh, icon, that would be really helpful, just to raise your hand. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll get some discussion going. Any immediate questions? Gosh, everybody's quiet. Is it too early? <laughs> I know maybe in this part of the world it is, not elsewhere. Um, okay, KK, thank you. I can yeah. see you've raised thank your you. hand. Would yeah. you like to kick us off? Yeah, I I enjoy you know very much uh, the, the 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 presentations. Uh, uh, by the different uh, <clears throat> presenters, uh, even though I, you know, I uh, have given up my <laughs> chance as a, a presenter uh, to, uh, you know, my 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 colleagues, uh, I I I have uh, you know a uh, 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 questions to uh, uh, Anastasia, uh, uh, Claire, and 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 Lindsay about you know the kind of uh, uh, active interventions we. Regarding protecting the the uh, you know, data collection uh, 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 issues relating to uh, you know those over researched groups uh, uh, because we have similar you know encounter similar kind of experience uh, before but and also we encounter a lot of challenge so I just want to see what kind of uh, you know uh, challenges you have encountered when when you try to uh, you know you know, protect through the, you know, the human rights lens, uh, those uh, over-researched uh, groups. Okay, thanks, KK. Maybe Kira, uh, Lindsay, yeah, would you I, like to come in? I can start and then hand over to, to Lindsay. Thanks very much, KK, for that question. Mm -hmm. It's a really important issue in, you know, in, in all dimensions of research practice. And I suppose, to start with, um, our, our starting point, you know, comes from community development approach and that communities should be involved in the conversations from the outset um, and not just add in. What we find in a lot of research that talks about taking, you know, co-production or collaborative or peer research, these concepts mm -hmm. in the literature, we find most often that communities are approached and added into the research process at a very late stage um, in terms of, of conceptualizing a project or thinking about what the research issue might be. And often then it, it can be tokenistic participation and certainly it's, whether it is tokenistic or not, you know, there could be good intentions, that, but often um, that the power dimension has not been considered. And in terms of knowledge production, you know, this is, is a huge issue for us as community development practitioners and as researchers. So at the very outset, um, we're putting forward the, the argument that communities need to be in, at the table from the very beginning um, in terms of what is the research issue in the first place or what is the social issue that needs to be researched um, and, and what is the perspective of the communities um, on which research is often inflicted. Um, Lindsay or Stacia, would you like to add maybe to that? Yeah, no, I suppose, yeah, I, I would echo what you're saying there, Kieran. And I suppose just in terms of colleagues, um, here this morning and I didn't um, explain in terms of travellers and Roma, I kind of flew by there, but in terms of um, the, the groups in which we're, we're in this morning, so travellers and Roma um, are minority ethnic groups um, and I suppose um, are recognised in Ireland as one of as the most marginalised and disadvantaged groups 
um, and experiencing structural racism discrimination, which um, of course has um, implications in terms of outcomes across all policy areas. So I apologize. Um, it was a bit early for me this morning. Um, no, I suppose I would I would agree, Kira, in terms of the active participation you know, in terms of shaping the research agenda, but also following that through. I mean, one of the, the kickbacks that we often get, and particularly from higher education um, institutions and others, is that, you know, the idea that you need to have a degree or formal education to undertake research. Um, and we, we would push back quite firmly on that in terms of, you know, using that peer led approach. Um, and it's becoming more increasing in terms of, I suppose, some of, some of the research projects that are coming to us is looking for peer-led uh, travellers to engage in research, but the, the provision is that they must have a research background or formal research background. And we're saying there are innovative ways and different, I suppose, approaches to research and really, I suppose, um, using that peer-led model, like I said, in the Orline Traveller Health Study, which really, you know, um, had to rely on an, an innovative model to, for, for peer researchers to undertake research on behalf of the community. So for example, for people who couldn't read and write, we had to work around that in terms of how do you make it um, appropriate and how do you make it flexible. So I think, you know, part of that active participation is also looking at what do we mean by peer led research? What do we mean about active participation? Um, and then also, as I said, spinning those power differentials in terms of, well, what does research look like? Um, in terms of, you know, that you don't have to be uh, from an, you don't have to have an academic background in order to undertake research and in order to inform research. If we are setting the agenda and if the communities are setting the agenda, well, then that is, you know, the approach that we would be taking and trying to work with that and trying to be flexible around that. Okay. And also Sorry, just one last final word just to say as well that education and training and consciousness raising are all part of the process as well. So while someone might not start out with an experience of research that they that can be built in. Sorry, Anastasia. I was just going to say two things. One, I think all of us in this room in particular have another responsibility. You know, if we're involved in the academy or involved in universities, there is also a question of how research agendas get set. Who sets what's going to get researched? either at a university level, at an institutional level, or at a national level. I've spent a lot of time in the last while, and we'll see how badly it turns out, trying to influence the, the next sort of round of the, the various institutes in, in this country that will be funding research. Because if from the very outset, the funding frame is set in a particular way, it becomes very difficult from there on in. And then secondly, uh, the guidance that Lindsay was talking about, I mean, what sort of questions in Pabby Point, the question we're asked, we ask people quite bluntly, what do you know about travellers, you know, other than the fact that travellers of Roma are an easily identified group that you can inflict yourself on fairly easily because they're, they're visible and they're known and they're less likely than the very wealthy living in gated communities to say, no, flip off, we're not having anything to do with you. So we ask questions like, what do you know about travellers? What's your understanding of travellers? What do you know about racism? What's your understanding of racism? Why do you want to undertake this research? What do you see as, as its value for the community that you're going to research? And then what sort of outcome? What are you going to do with the outcomes? Put them on a shelf and leave them to us to actually uh, to, to see their implementation. So we ask those questions fairly directly. Now, of course, the answers you get can vary and maybe they'll just run off and find somebody else who will be more amiable and less inclined to ask awkward questions. But uh, our, our thinking is we have to start doing that because over a period you can begin to shift the agenda and shift the thinking, shift the thinking overall. OK, thank you very much for those uh, responses. Um, and. I think some really uh, critical things and also I'm mindful of your comment earlier on about um, naming things directly. Uh, and I think that's part of that agenda as well. Also very much that peer led research of a kind described there is community development work um, that, that, that those lines are not that blurred, really. Um, Albert, I can see you have your hand up and we are rapidly hurtling towards uh, uh, the end of our session, but I've given you a little bit more time than I managed to give you yesterday when you had the, the chance to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very brief. And uh, my question goes to, to Nancy and I apologize if I missed part of the presentation because I joined a bit late. 
So based on your experience, what is the place of organizational policy, especially when faced with external pressures, when they say pressures, particularly where there are power relations? Because you talked about pressures, as, as, uh, especially on uh, when it comes to uh, diversity and inclusion, and sometimes pressure comes from outside. What do you think is the place of organizational policy? And more so when you are talking about incremental change vis-a-vis -vis immediate returns. I don't know whether you've, I don't know whether my question is clear or I need to take it again. Uh, you will advise me if I've addressed it correctly, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that, thank you so much for the question. I think policy is very important, but sometimes I think we exaggerate how important it is. That's my personal reflection though. Mm. Yeah, I've found in most places and organizations, usually the practice overtakes the policy. So you're already doing some things or following some practices that are not even in the policy. And to make matters worse, sometimes people don't even know the policy. Yeah, so either policy is struggling to keep up, number one, or number two, we don't even know the policies, yeah? Yeah, so sometimes I find that for most organizations, it's not really the most relevant thing, as important as the leadership, I think. And sometimes even as important as the team, because I really believe the teams are important. If they want to pressure the organization into a certain direction, they can in different ways, right? Yeah, even when the leadership is against some moves, yeah? For example, I've seen an organization using... Uh, uh, sort of trying to push the leadership. Oh, we need to have a, a, a climate survey as we call it, yeah? And when the climate survey was done and it was pushed from the team members, the findings were so revealing that the leadership had no choice but to follow the direction the team members were suggesting because to ignore that after having engaged in this study would have looked like you don't care about your stuff at all. Yeah, so I don't know how, if I'm addressing your question, but the pressure comes from all points. But also, I think all points need to know the power they have, right? I think teams have power. I think leadership has power. And I think policies have power. And I think as practitioners, if we empower all these sides, remind the teams, for example, of the power they have, because there's a certain loud voice that they have. There's a certain level where their voice cannot be ignored if they say this is a problem to us in different ways, right? This can be through unions, this can be through surveys, this can be through what they share with their HR, that this is unbearable to us. It's only, you can only take that pressure so far because it affects even productivity, right? I think the leadership has their own power, uh, but I also think the policies, yeah? Especially in our spaces where we are trying to, to influence change, yeah? You cannot work without trying to make sure the policies you're working with are also updated to be up to date with what moves you're trying to direct the organization towards. For example, for me, for inclusion, there are so many policies in, my, in, my, in my, the different workplaces I've been with. And I don't really, I'm not really so particular about having a separate inclusion policy. I would rather go into the HR policy and see how it can be made more inclusive, right? I would rather go to the staff handbook and try to influence uh, inclusion from that perspective rather than having a separate parallel policy for inclusion, if that makes sense, yeah? So for me, I find that both of those are important and I wonder if I've addressed your questions. Uh, yes, you Albert, have. Please confirm. Yes, you have, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up at this point in time. Um, if there are any other questions, please do come in. Uh, but I, I was, uh, Albert, yes, if you have yes, a question, have a, no problem. I have a comment for Shirley. And it's interesting that uh, especially the findings on tolerance for diversity, more so for women. My question is, do you think settings would matter? For example, urban vis-a-vis -vis rural? And more so when you are talking about women who are educated not having or having lower tolerance for, for diversity. Do you think settings would create a difference? 
Yeah, thank, thanks for the you know the questions because according to our division of labor, it's me. <laughs> uh, we're going to you know uh, take questions. Uh, and yeah, definitely yes. You know because of the community, it's uh, the name of that community is uh, the, the the fortune uh, uh, community. It's actually uh, you know uh, a low income communities. You know full of uh, what we call the uh, the public uh, rental housing in the context of Hong Kong public rental housing. Uh, in, in these days are uh, all, you know, having residents uh, with uh, low income groups. And uh, it, uh, because of this sort of uh, situations, it's, it's, it's easy if, uh, you know, uh, uh, people fail to have that sort of uh, interactions, then it's very easy for them to have uh, that sort of uh, you know, low tolerance of diversity and also uh, have problems with trust, uh, you know, uh, feeling that uh, the, the the community out there, uh, even though uh, the communities they have, they are, you know, residing in, but to them, subjective feeling is something out there, uh, you know, not not like them. So they have this sort of othering uh, uh, feelings uh, in it. And uh, the, 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 the implication uh, of our study Relating to this particular part is, you know, community development workers in 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 our part of the world, we we tend to, you know, uh, neglect. On the one hand, you know, the the the, the different uh, groupings within uh, uh, women, or of course, uh, at the same time, the different groupings within men. Uh, uh, so that's why we we see the importance of the intersectionality lens. And at the same time, we also need to see, you know, the different groupings, uh, they have different uh, fair needs for the uh, women. Uh, we have, we happens to have the possibility uh, of, uh, you know, doing a practice research uh, in uh, uh, another community. So we actively work on the kind of uh, feeling, I mean, the kind of uh, uh, low level of trust Towards the you know the communities, we directly you know work with uh, the 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 women there, and and we see that you know their their attitudes, uh, their their involvement uh, in in the community uh, associations increase. So, but if we if we fail to to identify this sort of you know differences within women group uh, uh, within men's group, then it's very easy for us to you know. Uh, missed the uh, you know their their fail need and fail to really mobilize them and then ultimately it's very difficult to really to deal with these issues about uh, diversity low tolerance uh, uh, towards mm -hmm. others and also low level of trust they have with the uh, you know the outside world. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, KK. Um... I'm not sure, Shirley, if you wanted to come in on that as well, or um, not really. But uh, I think it's true that um, because the community actually, on the whole, is low community com uh, is lo of low com uh, no income. So actually, all people there are relatively um, um, uh, um, poor in a sense. Um, so it's among them that those who are higher, <laughs> but actually they that. They don't represent the high income groups in Hong Kong, so mm -hmm. they are relatively high income people in the in the community. And I, and I do think that that the feelings of trust and and safety actually has been um, affected by the intersections of gender, income, education, and age, and 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 there's important implications on community development because when we work with the community, I think it's very important that we can differentiate um, the um, um, the people with of different characteristics of, of different background um, so that we can we can tailor make or we can appeal to them what what's important to them and and what what, what makes them difficult to to develop the sense of trust uh, and safety in, in in the community and and that's why we're interested to to examine in details how different factors are intersecting um, with each other Okay, thank you very much, Shirley. And I'm conscious now that we are a minute to the end. Um, I think Nargis may have some announcements to make, uh, but I'd like to thank everyone for joining this parallel session this morning. To all our presenters, Nancy, Kira, Lindsay, Anastasia, Shirley, 
kyle and kk and to all of you who have joined us and i hope that you enjoy the rest of the day um and the the various sessions that you're going to be joining in on um so i'm just going to hand over now to nargis for any final um comments that you need to share with us nargis before we close and in the end of our session i would like to invite invite all of you uh, to our informal welcome session today and especially you anastasia kira dominique lindsay uh, we'll be waiting for you on our uh, facebook page it will be live broadcasting the host of this uh, informal welcome session our colleagues from ukraine so you will be able to say some greetings uh, some welcome words from you introduce you uh, say express support to ukraine and it will be very important for us thank you okay thank you very much nagis and we are spot on time uh, for drawing to a close so um, i think we shall retire for a cup of tea or coffee and get ready for the next round of parallel sessions so thank you very much everyone enjoy the rest of the day and look forward to seeing you all again soon okay thank you thank you take care